be here for what should be a brilliant evening. I'm very excited um, because this is a project that started many years ago um, in WNO, where um, the idea was to create a program around migration. And six commissions were given out to writers who had some very important things to say about migration, displacement, isolation, cultural conflict and, and cultural identities and changes of identities. And it seemed extremely timely to have that conversation then. And this wonderful project, which was to include a gospel choir and a Bollywood um, dance group was intended to be performed this year. And of course, a pandemic came. So WNO decided to um, ask those writers to create a piece of work to respond to that. And it seems to me extraordinary that the, the piece of work that was about refugees uh, and migration is, is so pertinent because in this pandemic where it's been about a year, we have all been refugees in a small way, refugees from our loved ones and our lives. We've been displaced, we've been isolated in a small way with a great deal of hope for the future. But I think we've experienced something that um, is very profound. And these writers have been addressing that and writing about that. And so um, this evening, I'm delighted on the panel to have Shreya Senhandli and Miles Chambers, two of the writers, and Edith Crawford, one of the composers. Um, and I think in the audience, I really hope so, I can't see, you can see me, um, Eric Ngale Charles, uh, another of the writer, Will Todd, who was a composer for Migrations, the extraordinary Natasha Agarwal, who I would say is, is a wonderful opera singer, extraordinary dancer and mathematician. How phenomenal. Um, and of course, you, the audience, you're all extremely welcome. And I'm really glad you're here to share with us. I also hope this will be the beginning of some more um, panel discussions with the other writers and the other composer, Kitty Crawford, um, so that we could really ex expose and explore this subject to a much wider audience. So I'm going to start by, um, as you can see on the program, uh, asking Shreya uh, to talk a little bit about her piece, The Pledge. We're going to see the, the uh, video in a few minutes. It's five minutes long. Um, and, but really, I'm going to ask her to talk a little bit about the inspiration behind the poem and the way that she responded to the brief, which was really, how can we still play a part with no performance? How can we communicate in this strange pandemic world? So Shreya, how did you start with the poem? How did you come together for it? Well, um, hello everyone. Uh, let's to start with, we were we, we were all in this, diff the world found itself at a difficult juncture, in a difficult place, and uh, mired in a pandemic facing climate change, and the inequalities had sharpened to such a degree that we couldn't ignore them anymore. At such a time, uh, Welsh National Opera asked me and the others to um, address that. So uh, what came to me at that time, I started thinking about what we could do, because each of us was affected. So how could each of us address that? What could we do to change that situation, especially those of us in the arts? And as I thought about it, I remembered this um, childhood legend that had been told to me many times, especially when I was half asleep and my mother would croon it to me, um, of a Hindu goddess, uh, she's up there. Uh, that's the illustration I did for the poem, um, who rebuilds the world after every catastrophe, often man-made catastrophes. Um, so, uh, and, and it, it came to me that that's exactly what we need to do. And that she was representative of, of the things that we as artists needed to do. And the 10 arms that she has with the 10 weapons are weapons for enlightenment and sweeping away ignorance and creating empathy. Um, so I thought she would be perfect. And I started building a poem around her. Um, because, uh, you know, to, to every catastrophe, her answer is there is hope and we can go on. When some of the other gods, the sort of omnipotent trinity of male gods say, you know, they're a bad lot, these people, Let, let's, let's do away with them. And she'll go, no, no, 
no, let's give them another chance. I see good stuff there. So, so that, that was really the basis for my poem. I must say, I, I saw quite a few similarities in Miles's um, poem as well about hope, um, yeah. even despite the disasters. Um, so how, how universal a message do you think this is and how, how relevant is it today? Well, I think it's very universal because it's a call to arms to humanity. I mean, it might seem like, oh, it's an ancient Hindu goddess, but really she's an inner goddess. Um, she is representative of our strength, our creativity, and our hope. Um, as the poem says, um, you know, inner God is not a deity, but the humanity in us all. It's for us to change this world, not some divine avatar. So she, she is also representative, not just of all of us and the humanity in us, but of the arts. Because everything that she does is what the arts can do in this world and does often, it, it creates those connections and that throws light on, on other people and what we can all do together. You, you mention in the poem, the responsibility, if you like, of artists or your own pledge that you will use your art to make the world a better place. Um, it, yes, could you talk a little bit about that? What's prompted that, that sort of call to arms, as you say, but for the, from the point of view of the artist? From the point of view of the artist, yeah, um, I think, I mean, despite the fact that obviously uh, in the pandemic, scientists have come forward to create this vaccine, but we as artists have a very important role to play as well because the arts, despite everything being shut down, found a way to get through to people. So theaters were shut, but they started live streaming, artists started creating art, and putting it out there into the world however they could, online and everywhere else, because art, art uh, it, it, it keeps morale high, it kept the spirits up high. And I really think we have all through this last year. I mean, not me personally, I'm talking about the arts in general. So it was that, and knowing that it's happened before, you know, we've been through wars and we've been through, uh, and then, refugee crises and all sorts of things that, that people have gone through. And it's been music and the arts and poetry that has kept people going, even just oral uh, traditions that, that have kept going and uh, kept instilling hope in humanity throughout over the ages. And I just thought we can do our little bit as well. I can do my little bit. I can make a pledge that can also be a nice poem that uh, that has rhythm and, and has a message that um, instills hope. And um, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world, though, was it? The process of um, filming it. Do you want to mention <laughs> some of the problems of a pandemic and filming in a pandemic? Well, yeah, no, it's, it's, it was even the process of actually writing the poem was because the children were at home, you know, we were in lockdown and uh, there were delivery men at the door all the time and the dog was getting boisterous. So, and I was, my mother was calling from India and I was doodling at the same time, the doodle that became a part of the poem itself. And then taking, and despite that, and maybe because of that, it sort of came together to um, be a, a sort of nice melting pot of many influences. And then when we started filming it with the wonderful Seema Gonsai, uh, our filmmaker, um, we had to do it in our back garden. And it just happened to be the day when some quad bikers decided to do some racing beyond our garden. It never usually happens, never. Uh, but then that was the day they chose, it was a Saturday. And uh, it gave us a nice kind of backing track, but I'm so glad it was eventually replaced by the fabulous tabla of Pritam Singh, which was so much better than the quad bikers in the back. <laughs> um, we also had my daughter doing the dancing, uh, she's, she's not trained in Indian dance, but we sort of pushed her into service as well. She was more than happy to do it, but we had to cobble her, her outfit together. We didn't have those, um, we didn't have an Indian dance outfit. So bits from me and bits from her, from their uh, box of costumes, you know, Superman and Supergirl and so on. We got little bits together. Then Seema brought her dancing anklets, the guru which is essential because it's mentioned in the poem as well. We didn't have it. She brought her childhood ones with her, which was fabulous. And she gifted it to my daughter. So it was a lovely experience, though very challenging in some ways. 
<laughs> well, let's have a look now, if we could, at the, the spoken word version. We have two versions of the pledge. We'll look at first at the spoken word version and, and see your daughter in it too. So um, I over to you and the techno technological people. <laughs> In these stifling, searing, expiring times, we're under fire because we're Asian. Our lives don't matter because we're black, uprooted like trees because we're indigenous. Disaster and disease pinning us back. Then I hear your anklets peel, the rhythm of your faraway feet. Then I know you're with us still, though anger and greed hold sway. You've been with us since infancy when our mothers crooned your tales. From the Himalayas you surged to us like the Ganges to the bay. Silencing your divine consort who danced the world away. With arguments for redemption you arm yourself again. With your third eye, your vatic searchlight, for your ten arms you choose these tools. A chakra shaping unity. Lotus wisdom that blooms. Intellect cutting through us, flaring hope that looms. Your relentless arrows of energy aim to impart resolve. Your conscience piercing trident instills the muse in all. In that is our salvation, as in childhood when you called. We heard your chant and brandished arms of ink and paint and glue. Besides didgeridoos and violins and the twinkling of Kung Ru. As we grew, we heard you less, we ignored our conscience more. But now we've come to the end of times in a world phantasmagoric, where the scourge runs loose and the struggles ahead are cosmic. We are listening, Devi, once again, for blasts from your seismic conch. Stumbling through this oppressive night, we finally hear footfall. As your journey begins anew, of your we take up cudgels. With piano, pen and tabla too, these terrors we must trammel. Asians on the front line, blacks pinned underfoot, the indigenous uprooted and artists the powers forsook. Inner goddess, not a deity, but the humanity in us all. It's we who must change this world, not some divine avatar. This is my conch blast, my pledge, my promise, my vow. To use my art to transmute what's wrong, not later, not soon, but now. Very powerful, Shreya, and, and I can't hear the quad bikes at all. <laughs> That's excellent. It, it's very good. Um, <laughs> this is time for anybody now to ask questions. Um, it's quite early on in the, in the seminar, so I, I expect people are still finding their voice, as it were. Um, but the, the process is you can put it in the Q&A or you can put it straight in the chat. Um, we can't see you, uh, the audience, so you'll need to do one or the other. And uh, we have a team of people who are very adept at um, pointing out um, questions. I don't have any questions at the moment. Um, so I can go on to, uh, wait a minute, there is uh, Eric. Eric is asking, whatever gives you hope for the future? So where does that wellspring of hope and positive energy come from, Shreya? I think the next generation featured in this poem gives me hope because they, they're very focused on what they need to do, climate change, tackle that, inequality. They're talking about it in their schools already. And that is one of the reasons that in my, why I've been in my poem focused on childhood and the fact that we were closer to more in touch with our conscience you know, our conscience and our, and our, uh, well, you know, sort of a good, goodwill. Uh, and as we grew, we, we sort of moved away from it. So, so the future, the next generation certainly gives me hope, but how a lot of us have ma managed uh, to get through this pandemic with such resilience and such hope. And the fact that we might yet 
turn this around. It looks like we might and rebuild and redeem and uh, that gives me hope too. Thank you. We're going to um, have another video of um, Tria's piece with, the, the, with music. So that I think there's plenty of time to talk about that. So I'd like to move over and talk to Miles, Miles Chambers, who's here. Good Hi. evening, welcome. Good evening. And congratulations on your piece too. Um, I, I, there are a couple of things that struck me about okay. The, the similarities, they're very different lens through which you're seeing the world, but um, not least the, the um, urgency that, that, you know, not soon, but now. And I think that comes across in your poem too. Um, and the call to arms, the sense that um, things, there is hope and there, there are things that can change. Could you talk a little bit about how you feel about that? Well, the, the urgency coming from the place that um, what, what I'm discussing in, 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 in my piece has, has gone on for long enough. And it, it, there's a whole history of it. I mean, I'm coming from a place where I'm listing different people in, in, in the past, in history, and different events and different experiences that have plotted, plotted a, a path of... of, of should I say racism, should I say discrimination or, or, or exclusion or uh, being held back or not, not developing or not, not something, something um, uh, an obstacle and a struggle. Uh, uh, and so what, what highlighted for me with, with what happened in, in, in the summer and, and the, the, uh, the, the, the requests of of WNO was that yet again we can see something this happening and it, it just needs to stop immediately and it's ridiculous in in today's world with, with in our society uh, with what's going on now that w when you look at it it's it, it ridiculous that it, it's even continuing so then I wanted to say, well, what, what can we do? What will, would we want to see? What, and what are the specific in occurrences or instances that we need to address? And that was what was behind what I was trying to say in, in that piece. Very strongly, incredibly <laughs> potent and powerful piece, as, uh, as people will hear if they haven't heard it already. And beautifully delivered, I must say, really lovely cadence of the, the language comes across. It seems to me there's two things going on simultaneously. One is the need for society to change. Never again should there be the, the sense that people are saying, oh, I didn't expect you to be the writer. You know, that the, the kind of blindness and, and the, you know, negative perceptions of, of people. So society, more representation and, and more obvious pathways for, for people to grow and role models to, to, to admire and, and look up to and aspire to comes across incredibly powerfully. But also the inner world that um, we have to change, we being all of us. And um, I, that was where I saw a kind of link with Shreya's. I don't want to overplay it, but it did strike me now as saying there's, there's something incredibly powerful about those two things um is that how you see it is it yeah i mean i think this, this quote I think it was a quote that said the uh journey of a thousand steps um the journey of a thousand miles starts with one step or there's a quote in the bible uh where jesus says the kingdom of heaven is is within you <laughs> uh, and i'm not preaching a sermon here but um it starts from our, us, how we feel inside, our mindset. That, that's, that's what produces what, what is around us, you know. Most of what we see in our society, most of what is being invented or created or built, started with a thought in somebody's head. And um, I, I, again, another quote as a man thinketh, so is he. So, so yes, there, there's, an inner, there's an inner journey or an inner experience or or something inside of us, which which we all need to change, um, yeah. and our you know a perception of ourselves, or perception of other people, or that that frame of mind. And 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 
I think once that's where the change really starts, and then we'll see an outer change. So, so I was listing or trying to identify for me through my experiences what specifically that change might look like, and and you know the culmination um, of I see three hundred different nationalities who are coming to the table with the special the associated world where every opinion matters and every voice can make a wish. There's an empowerment and um, a, a validity of everybody and everybody um, has, has a contribution to make and should be put, placed in a position where they can make that contribution. And, and obviously, uh, with the way I perform it, there is an emotional connection there. There is... Um, uh, feelings from experiences I've had and from things I've seen that have evoked emotions inside of me and when I'm, I've written it and I performed it those emotions are coming out because it's um, I think your performance as I said earlier is extraordinary because there's a, it's a, a really potent powerful piece Thank you. but it's um, there's a gentleness in your performance too a humanity it's not angry, it's, it's very philosophical. Do you think the pandemic might, might have been helpful to us to be more reflective, um, maybe? Yeah, I think so. I think that, I mean, it's ironic where, um, and I think Black Lives Matter March in summer was a catalyst for this. It's ironic that that came out of the end of a lockdown where yeah. we had a lot of time to reflect and think and to question ourselves and to question the world, to question our society. And, and also, I mean, the medium of the arts, I think that to an, ex to, to an extent, an aspect of the arts might replace the way we saw or used to see religion where every Sunday we'd go or Saturday we'd go to church and worship. Whereas art, artists and art could also be a mirror that holds up to the world. And we, we, we see ourselves and we're told about ourselves or told about what we could be like. Art can or possibly take on that role or take on that position or replace the position that we used to put on church by going into um, a place. I mean, some of us still do. <laughs> going into a place and being told or being reminded of how we should be or, or um, what we should be doing or what we're doing, which isn't right. Or... or, or how we could be better people and uh, and do better than we we are um and, and i think that that it was that being able to use this medium to put across this point of view is very pertinent and, and you talk about the institutions artistic institutions needing to change as well very yeah. very importantly well um, i wanted to ask you how it all came together as well the filming you know how was that it, you're outside all the time, aren't you? Yeah, we were outside, uh, social distance as much as we could. Um, the filmmakers from Bristol as well, so we knew Bristol very well. Um, he, he, I, he filmed or had been filming with uh, sometimes when I've been performing at other stuff, so it was nice to finally work with him. But um, and he he was familiar with my work, and I was familiar with his work, so we kind of. Um, well, worked together quite nicely. It was it was a comfortable arrangement, and um, I, I had a lot of respect for his vision and his sight, and he kind of got what I was trying to say. Um, but yeah, um, I, I think that um, the two of us coming together helped to complement what what we were trying to say and do with that piece. Well, let's watch that piece now, then, if that's okay. all right, um, Ella Martina. Um... Change can come. <laughs> come. Hush. Spare a few minutes. Be very still. Let me describe a scenario I've penned with my quill. I see Tamala Motown's 60s and Louis Armstrong's pain. I see James Brown's conviction and Aretha Franklin's disdain. I hear sentiments being echoed in that famous Sam Cooke song. A change gonna come. 
What made us stand up and say enough is enough? What made us get real? What made us get serious? What made us get tough? Did the blue hills of Mississippi cry out to you? Did the voices from the flames of Lynchville scream our salvation is overdue? Or did you just stare in the mirror one morning and say, I love you? I hear the laments of past heroes, the wounds that have not been healed, and their antagonizers still saying, I don't care. I see that look of surprise. Can you really play this part as well as me? I see that look of shock. Did you really write this amazing story? I see that parents disapprove. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you, wouldn't you be happier, I mean happier, with a young man who looks more like us? I see that look of fear. I know they got paid more, but please, please, don't make a fuss. I see Martin Luther King dreaming, looking over into the promised land. I see the Empress Moazi with your sword in her hand. I see Bernie Grant warning of the storm that's going to come. And I see Stephen Lawrence falling to the ground and saying, I don't want a diamond. I see Marlon Thomas begging for a difference to be made. I see the minister, Louis Farrakhan, telling us a spade is a spade. I see Nelson Mandela appealing to our collective conscience and saying, this world is your business. I see Paul Stevens and Guy Bailey saying what is doesn't have to be how it is. I see Diamond Runnels saying there's more he wanted to achieve. And I see Eric Gardner and George Floyd on the floor saying I can't breathe. I hear Marcus Garvey promising the Black Star Liner will be coming to our show. And I see the Emperor Haley Selassie is gaming until the colour of a man's skin is of no more significance than the colour of a man's eyes. There will always be war. I see a world where we're judged on the contents of our character, not the colour of our skin. I see men and women sitting around boardroom tables waiting for the dreadlock CEO to begin. I see 300 different nationalities, each coming to the table with a special dish. I see a world where every opinion matters and every voice can make a wish. I hear the dulcet tones of reggae music being played in the student halls of Oxford University. I see inspired future leaders setting their hearts on their destiny. I feel passionate professors lecturing in, in our established institutions, teaching the world about our black history. I see the produce of Windrush in the Houses of Columns, holding Parliament to task. And I see the Prime Minister of the UK sipping pineapple punch from a coffee flask. I see men and women up and down the country polishing awards from elegant theatre halls, playing parts written by them, for them, enabling them to be their best. I see producers and directors telling ethnic Oscar-winning stories that would have been laid to rest. I see little black boys and little black girls reaching for the skies, grabbing their shining star bloated with self-love and confidence because they know who they are. I see black men and women doing all their talent and ability has led them to believe. But I see a chorus of melanoid brothers and sisters exclaiming in unison, I can breathe, I can breathe, I can breathe. I say, let's make this happen. Let's not worry about how. Let's do it today. Let's do it now. I see a world with amazing ability and possibility. I see you. I see me. I see Mawazi. What do you see? <laughs> but it needs a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> and it ends with a question. Yes. Yeah, which um is is really powerful as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um thank you. there's a statement in the question. It says a powerful piece. If we were not meant to speak, why then, my lord, did you give us a voice? Um, but there's somebody that would like to answer a question as well. Michael? I think that's, that's um, 
part of the, the question and answer that isn't quite working. So um, we'll move on to, um, I think, I think maybe we'll gather the questions, if the team could gather the questions as well for the, the end of the session. I think it's easier, it stops, it, otherwise the flow um, rather goes. But um, is there anything else that, Miles, that you'd like to say about um, the process and the piece? And, and how maybe how it fits in with the migrations piece coming forward? Yeah, no, I mean, one, just, just, just the fact that um, I, I really appreciate the, the Welsh National Opera going down this route and um, uh, commissioning us to, to look at this and um, asking us to react in this way to, and, and to tell this story and, and, and to, to get us to discuss and think and look at, and look at what we're, we're saying here. Um, and it reflects, to, to an extent, it reflects migrations because migration is about obviously migrating, refugees, displacement, perhaps belonging, um, feeling that you, uh, you know, feeling you have a home or wanting a home, and um, coming coming to a different place, perhaps where you uh, and and being accepted and being treated as equal, and um, you know the. the this piece is a, is, is, is a continuation or a reflection of that. It's, it's a result, you know, the, 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 that, that um, aspect of what we're talking about has to do with, with race and discrimination or um, development or perception in, in, in society. Um, it, you know, the, the, um, lots of us have migrated or emigrated from, from, from places, from different places around the world and we're now here. And this this place is this country is is very much a multicultural society, and um, I think I think identity and who you are and just belonging and feeling uh, uh, you know and having a home and and feeling and um, that that you're comfortable and happy and be fair and have the greatest possibility to develop and 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 be yourself and you've got an equal opportunity and equal chance to fulfill your potential um is it, it, it's very important and um I, I also feel that that if these issues are addressed uh we the, the, uh, this country the world would be a much more interesting, better, fulfilling, uh, and powerful place. Well, I think you, you really say that very well. And, and it's lovely because it is so positive in that sense. Your vision, what you see is, I think, what we all want to see. Well, you know, <laughs> we perhaps should aspire to want to see. So, you know, with the boardroom waiting for the CEO with dreadlocks to address you, it, it, the normalization of it, just that's how it is. And that's how people can be their best person. And I think you, you really get that across. And people that know me will know that I'm incredibly keen to get these pieces and this work more widely seen. And if anybody out there can help, please do, because I, I really think they're, there's they're so good, they're so interesting, they're exactly what the opera should be doing at the moment. And you are helping the opera be the opera company that it should be and needs to be. So I'm, I think we're all very grateful to you for it. Um, and it's so exciting, it's just brilliant. So I'm gonna go on to the next um, guest, our panelist, Edith Crawford, because of course, um, as an opera company, part of this is to make the words sing. And I do hope that you know, further down the line, all these poems will, will have the opportunity to be sung in, in some form or, or other. So um, Edith, um, good evening, welcome. And thank you very much for coming. Um, how does this come to be? I mean, Edith, I've seen and heard your work. I, I see you more as a, an R&B singer, um, wonderful uh, sing song, singer, songwriter and, and singing in the Welsh language. This is quite different. How, how was it for you? 
Hi, and um, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's very exciting to be on here tonight. Um, and yeah, it is very different to what I usually do. Um, I have been singing as a uh, one woman band uh, for the last three years. Um, recent, more so recently, I've become a producer and I mix and master and produce my own music. Um, so this was a completely different experience for me and it was just just such a fun one as well uh, for me to enter this this whole new uh, world um, and thanks to Maris for uh, you know including me in this project and, and making me feel very welcome um, and, and encouraging me really and it's been yeah really really great uh, I, I absolutely loved composing um, the pledge and I really wanted to wanted to do the written piece justice really um so yeah it was just really 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 fun such a fun experience for me i was thinking if i uh, you know had the whole resources of the welsh national opera orchestra to play with it's a bit like standing at a sweet shop window isn't it i mean where do you start and um what did you you have to leave things out i, I don't know how many instruments you worked with but how did you feel about that, having this extraordinary orchestra at your disposal? Yeah, I, I was blown away, really. Um, I was speechless uh, and the orchestra was absolutely amazing. And be, being able to be there in person as well and see them perform it live was just incredible. I've never actually been able to experience something like that. Um, but yeah, it was it was a very tough decision um, picking between different instruments, and I think we ended up with more, um, a, quite a bit more than than I should have. But I think it really, really added um, to the final piece, and it was just um, such a fun fun time to be able to pick out of all these wonderful instruments. And I was really, really happy that we were able to use you know tabla and lot percussive sounds um, just because I wanted to give it a very lively uh, emp empowering and strong um, feel to the music um, and you know I think the words and the written piece really spoke um, through me and I wanted to really yeah I was massively inspired by the written piece I think it's an absolutely beautiful piece and very relatable um, and I was just, I, I, you know, when I spoke to Shreya the first time around um, and she explained the words and really went through the whole written piece, it was very inspiring for me. And I, I instantly got a feel and a vibe to what I wanted to compose and how I wanted to use the, these instruments to complement each other. Um, and yeah, very powerful written piece. And I wanted the um, composition to be the same. I wanted it to have that powerful moving movement throughout the whole um, yeah, throughout the whole piece. And I, I think, yeah, I think that was very successful. And I just loved hearing it live as well. So yeah, it was very fun. Good. And uh, what musical influ influences did you bring to it? Did you have anything that you thought about or used as a sort of pillar to build the piece around? Yeah, so I think it started off with the tabla drums. Um, and I, I just think they're an absolutely amazing instrument. And I was um, really excited to be able to use those um, in the piece. Uh, they, they sounded so much better uh, live um, and absolutely amazing job. Um, it was just incredible. And then um, at, when I was younger, I, I played the violin um, and I got to quite a, a decent um, grade, but I just didn't carry on through my music um, music career, which is unfortunate, but I do have a violin, which I want to pick up again and start learning. So <laughs> I wanted to use, uh, <laughs> I wanted to use some um, strings to just really brighten and uplift the whole song. Cause I really, I absolutely love strings and I think they're completely beautiful, um, especially when there's multiple parts being played. Um, same with the viola and the cello as well. And it just gives it a really strong, um, clean and fresh feel to the music. So I think those those really added um, to the whole feel as well. So yeah, yeah, it was, it was really, really um, incredible to be able to choose my own instruments to be putting into my own comp composition and then seeing it all come to life was just amazing as well. Well, on that, you have the added element of a dancer as well. Um, how did you feel about that? I mean, it's, it's beautiful choreography, isn't it? And so, so perfectly married to the, the text. Yeah. And as a, as a musician, how did that feel? Amazing. I've always wanted to have a music video where um, there are dancers um, in it. So, um, 
um, to see, you know, the composition and uh, Shreya's written piece all come together with the music video as well outside the Millennium Centre was just amazing. And <laughs> the whole kind of um, the art behind it as well. Um, I just loved how they they'd used the dancing um, and the way that they filmed it with all the background really worked. It really, really, really worked. Excellent. Well, um, I'm glad. I think Natasha he is here in the audience, and I think Seema, the filmmaker, is also here. So congratulations to you two as well. And let's now go on and watch this beautiful video. Thank you.
Wow, it's really wonderful. Um, and it's so lovely to see that all the elements of opera coming together in that piece. So it Edith, really it's, um, it must be, you're, you're still very young. It must be quite extraordinary to, to have this experience. Do you want to do more of it? Do you see yourself moving more into opera? I mean, I would love to. I'm, I'm always up for experiencing something new and working with these amazing, amazing, so talented people um, was just incredible for me. And it's really opened some doors for me, um, really, truly, um, you know, just just in the elements of producing and composing in different styles and different ways um, and working closely uh, with, um, you know, with you as a company has just been amazing for me so it's definitely something I'd love to pursue um in in however I can really so I've got two questions here one is you've almost answered it is a full-scale opera a future plan and the second one is did you have any composition training when you were younger um so for the um com composing uh, the only kind of official training I've had is through college and school um, and when I was uh, throughout school I have um, learned how to use Sibelius um, and that's kind of opened the window for me to be able to feel like uh, producing is something that I want to pursue as well um, but in terms of producing my own music um, I've just I've just picked it up on my own and um, just constantly learning new things from new people, uh, you know, like working on this project. It's just been given me new learning steps, really. So, And as I say, I really hope that this, this whole project gets a, a bigger life and more profile. I know that I think the BBC might be doing a programme about the opera company and this will certainly be profiled in it. Um, there's another question which has is to Miles. Um, says, I believe you're Bristol-based, Miles. Bristol seems a very angry place at the moment. Why do you think this is? And is anger the best catalyst for change in your experience? Mm. Why do I think Bristol's angry at the moment? Well, obviously you, you've had the, um, um, the recent confrontation uh, um, that's been on the news with uh, the police and uh, I'm assuming that you, you're, you're, you're talking about that immediately. Um, so it, it, may, it may appear angry at the moment, but I, 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 in react, direct reaction to that, I think Bristol's a city of paradoxes, that um, it, it has the extremes of everything, that city. So it has um, a really forward thinking, uh, upwardly mo moving, positive energy that it wants to um, right the wrongs and um, and make itself a, a great city and yet so it has it's steeped in a lot of socialism and um, on one aspect it has, um, uh, it, it, it's got um, uh, a racial racial past uh, a racial past in, uh, which is its conscience there's extremely good education extremely bad education there's um, uh, very well, well-to-do people and people living in abject poverty. So 
those, those paradoxes coming together create conflict, which creates drama, and that that's that makes the city potent and full full of the energy that it has. Um, and uh, do I think anger? I, I think when you're reacting to a, an issue which which concerns you, you go through different stages. And um, one of the, the immediate stages is anger. I'm, I'm not I'm not reacting to what's happened this week because um, I I I don't I, I do have an opinion on that, but I don't, I don't think that's um, I don't want to comment on that. But but um, I think if you want to change then, and you want people to change the way they think, then that, that's the whole point of what we're discussing now, that the arts is one medium and one way uh, and has, is a tool for change uh, and a way of, of the, with a mirror up against ourselves and taking a, another look at ourselves. Um, I, I, I personally would feel that, and uh, anger isn't, may not be the best way for change. It, it would create more conflict and more anger and uh, will oppose. I think there's emotions when people invest and express emotions because they're so, um, we are, or they are so, so uh, attached or have so much feeling invested in whatever the issue is. But the real change comes from, uh, us really be in place in a position where we reflect and clearly see that a situation, um, we, we need to look at a, a situation differently and, and do something differently. And, and that that would come from something, uh, something, something more, uh, something more personal inside than 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 anger. I might be upset. I might be a bit. <laughs> um. I've got a lot of um, in the chat. There are a lot of people saying how incredibly moving and powerful the pieces are, um, and um, so I think I'll, I'll share those with you later. Um, I, I'd like uh, so Will Todd has asked Miles and Shreya, what is the hardest thing about being commissioned as opposed to having your own idea that you can develop freely? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, I kind of, I always work to commission, which is a strange thing, I suppose, because I started life as a journalist. So I'm told to go get that story and I go get that story. In this case, it's, it's a case of, you know, go write that poem. And uh, nobody said it should be a poem or an, or an illustrated poem. So obviously it grew from, but the it's kind of an impetus. It, it's something that, you know, you know that's what your audience wants. You know, as, a, as an artist, you have a message. And I was going to answer earlier about the anger bit. Anger, when you then transmute it and use it, you know, set, put it forward through the arts and you're maybe sugarcoating it a little, but not in any negative way. You're lacing it with humor. You're providing vivid imagery. Uh, that, that's when the anger becomes really powerful. So uh, working to commission to me doesn't feel alien. Uh, and I find it's, it's good. It's, it's a little bit like my journalism because it, it gives me a few parameters to work within. But within that, I can be as creative and as uh, yeah, vivid and funny and everything I want to be. Thank you, Miles. Um... Would you prefer uh, to write your own piece or just uh, was the commission stimulated? Well, I've come from a graphics design background and, and, and with that, the, you always had a brief. And I, I'm thinking um, sometimes it's good to be able to have some kind of parameters in which you can focus and, uh, uh, and structure your thoughts and, and, and creative, creative ideas on. Sometimes when you're, you're staring at a blank piece of paper, you think, well, where do I go? <laughs> Sometimes it's good to have some kind of um, brief or, or, or um, uh, parameters in which you're supposed to write. But particularly this, this particular commission was 
what I wanted to say. You know, it, it was it was it was made in heaven. <laughs> but that's, Good to hear. You know, um, our, the things I've written in the past and the stuff that I write around completely reflect what I was asked to, to write this time. And it was more, it, I didn't actually see it as a commission. In this case, um, it was more about giving, being given the license to, to express myself. Okay, good. About um, well, I've got, a, I've got a question, I'll hold that thought, but there are two small questions for Miles. Well, one is not a small question for Miles. Um, if this was set to music, what, what sort of instruments if your piece was set to music and style, would you like to have it? Gospel, definitely. Yeah, there's Gospel. there's a chorus or crescendo, a climax in the poem, which definitely I would say um, a gospel sort of, you know, uh, a, a, a genre of gospel music below that and complementing that would, Very good. Would, really, would, really, would really bring it out. Yeah, yeah. And somebody's asked me if you would um, repeat the last line of your poem because they didn't hear the it. The last line of my poem. The actual last line. Well, okay. Well, okay. Maybe the last two lines because <laughs> they <weren't. laughs> Okay. I see a world of equality and amazing possibility. I see you. I see me. I see Mawati. What do you see? And the what do you see, I think, is, a, a, is really strong. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're, I have to wrap it up now. Um, I should probably just have kept that to the very last moment. But I've got one more thing I'd like to ask all three of you, really, Edith, Treya and Miles, that um, what would you like to see WNO doing? What more? Um, you know, having had this experience, what could we do? What should we do and, and how can we make this just the beginning of a much bigger story? Shreya? <laughs> um, it would be lovely to see WNO and other operatic uh, organizations and other arts organizations in this country and around the world uh, just amplify other voices more. Um, so, you know, uh, it's Migration is fabulous. There's so many stories weaving through it. But how wonderful would it be if you started making operas about each of those particular experiences as well? So they're like, it's a, it's it's like a start. It's a brilliant start. It's like a start that you can take further. And so there could be one that was a an all Indian opera and one that was about other cultures and you know instead of the, the little bits, which I think work fantastically. Uh, it's not criticism at all. But I, I see that as the start of many more operas of that nature. Thank you. And, and, and Miles, in a way, you say it in your poem, don't you? You want to see the, um, but I'm, no, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but what, no, what else do you? <laughs> <laughs> I meant you have addressed it in a way, but yes, how would you well, um, answer that question? As Judge Surya said, more of this, please. Um, you know, and I'm alluding to migrations as well. Um, and, you know, we've all got stories to tell. And um, just, I, I, you know, the Welsh National Opera is, is doing great stuff and great work. Um, um, I, I have to stress that. But um, just so that we're in a position where theatre, opera, these, these institutions, which are stereotypically white middle class, um, our arenas where we, we were going expecting to see everybody from all um, from all social stratifications of society telling their stories and equally we, we can immerse in their culture and, and, and see the world from their point of view and be engaged in, 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 in the stories that they tell the way they want to tell them through their eyes and, and it's not it's not it's not it's not an unfamiliar or normal thing to see that. That's what I'd want to see. I don't know, just the world after not everywhere. <laughs> the old bit, the new bit. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, the hippodrome. Um and I, I I I again stress it's it's great that we've we've had the discussion. It's great that we've had this um uh, we we've been given these commissions and it, it, it 
great that that we're we're connecting with, with these real issues and and migrations will be great when it comes out as well. You've got, yeah. to, got to see that. I know. And you did? Yeah, I totally agree with Miles and Treya. Um, more of this, like um, more live events when the time is right and when the time comes, obviously. Um, I would I'd be so excited and happy to to see these pieces come to life in real life. So <laughs> yeah, definitely carry on like this, for sure. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, the WNO has been so, um, so fortunate to have, have you working with us and I'm sure we've all learned huge amounts. And it has really shown that this is this is the future of opera, isn't it? Um, really? This is where we want to be. It's It's been fantastic, and I hope it's very much the beginning. Um, I think the pieces deserve a very, very much wider audience, and I, I will try, we'll all try our best to make it a wider audience. And I want to thank you, the audience, tonight for being here. Um, as I say in the chat, I can't read it all quickly enough, but it's all, it's great to see you, great to hear your thoughts, opinions, the creativity, and um, um, we just very much look forward to the next iteration of this great project. So for me, thank you very much. Thank you. And good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.